welcome to the Actual Tech Media EcoCast. My name is Jess and I am excited to be here with you all today. But before we jump into our content, I have some basic information that I wanna cover with you. All right, let's kick off our day here today by taking a quick tour of your audience console. And we're going to start with the questions window. So if you haven't already said hi, there is a whole audience of cool humans out there. So reach out and give a wave to the other members of the actual tech media community. Now, keep in mind that if you do have any technical issues today, a browser refresh is going to fix just about anything. But if those tech gremlins are clinging on today, no problem. Just throw a comment in the question section and our crew will be there to help. We also want this to be an informative webinar for you. So throughout today's EcoCast, we hope you'll get engaged and ask all your burning questions. Not only will we have team members responding to you over a live chat, we will also have a dedicated Q&A session at the end of our presentations. Now, if we don't get to your question during the live webinar today, don't worry because the awesome experts that we have here with us will be following up after we wrap. All right, next up, there's going to be lots of cool aha moments on the EcoCast today. And if you want to share those with your community, we've made it nice and easy for you. You can use the Twitter button right there on your audience console and the hashtag for today's EcoCast will be automatically added to your post. All right, our last stop on this guided tour, be sure to check out the handouts tab for some awesome resources and takeaways from our speakers here today. We have an info pack collection, solution briefs, white papers, data sheets, free trials, eBooks, upcoming webinars, and more. So many great resources, so be sure to go explore. Now, if that wasn't enough fun, we also have some exciting prizes that we'll be giving away throughout today's EcoCast. I'm gonna tell you a bit more about those later on, but a few quick reminders for you all. First, you do need to be here live in attendance at the EcoCast in order to qualify to win a prize. And we will follow up with all of you after we wrap. Now, all winners must submit an IRS form W9 to Actual Tech Media, and all winners must meet the Actual Tech Media prize terms and conditions. Now, if you don't know what those full T's and C's are, that's fine. We've got the full thing for you. Just head on over to that handouts tab, click in, scroll down to the bottom, and you'll find them waiting for you there. Now, the absolute most important thing to remember is that we love getting all your insightful questions during these live webinars. In fact, we love it so much that we actually have a special additional prize for all you inquisitive folks out there. So in today's EcoCast, we will be giving away a prize for the best question asked in each of our live sessions. Now, the expert speakers and teams will review all questions asked after we wrap the webinar, which means that even if your question does not get read out in a live session, there is still a chance to win. If you are a lucky winner here today and you would like to donate the value of your prize, we have several wonderful organizations that we partner with. So let us know when we follow up about your big win and we'll get that rolling for you. Again, we are so happy to have you all here with us live at the EcoCast today and we want to keep that good feeling going so let's connect on social media. Reach out and connect with Actual Tech Media on Twitter and on LinkedIn. We have lots of great content and we always want to hear from you. Now, if you're looking for more awesome content and resources right after we wrap the EcoCast today, be sure to subscribe to the Actual Tech Media channel on YouTube. Another fun way to win a prize and, hey, grow this awesome community is to refer an industry friend or a coworker to the Actual Tech Media webinar series. Now, you'll find a link to do that right in your handouts tab, and you will also be automatically redirected at the end of the webinar. And both you and your coworker or friend could win a prize, and we hold those drawings every month. So be sure to refer a friend because, it, hey, it could quite literally be a win-win situation. Next, we have a cool opportunity for all the decision makers out there to get connected with new and emerging tech and innovative vendors. Here's how it works. All you need to do is click on the link in your handouts tab, fill out a quick application, and the actual tech crew will then match you with some vendors that we think you should probably be chatting with based on your needs. There will also be fun opportunities that you get to choose to join in, like surveys, test runs, uh, new solutions, extended demos, and so on. You'll get some chances to win extra prizes, you'll chat with great people, and you'll learn about the hottest new trends in tech. So be sure to apply, or hey, send that link to a decision maker on your team. Now I wanna take a quick minute here to remind you all about one of my favorite resources and that is ransomware.org. You can find out everything you need to know about ransomware, how to prepare, prevent, and recover. This site is jam packed with information, helpful tips, checklists, strategic approaches, case studies, everything you need in one place. So wherever you are in your ransomware preparedness journey, there is something for you at ransomware.org. Go check it out and start exploring. 
All right, I have one more exciting resource I have to tell you about today, and that is the Gorilla Guide Book Club. It's going to give you access to free enterprise IT books authored by top industry experts. So you can stay up to date on trending enterprise technology. And yes, these books will work on your Kindle, your mobile device, and as I said, they are completely free. You can download these awesome resources at gorilla.guide, and there's a link for you in that handouts tab as well. All right, well, we have covered a lot of important things already, and I don't know about you all, but I am excited to dive in. So let's get going. All right, my friends. Well, I hope that you are ready and excited because today we are talking about ransomware, preventing phishing and spear phishing attacks. And this is one of my all time favorite topics because I love this cross section. Today we get to talk about, you know, uh, work life, our personal life, our organizational structures. We're going to talk about technology. We're going to talk about innovation. We're going to talk about storytelling and training. We're going to talk about the human element. This is the super cool Venn diagram point where all of the most interesting conversations come together. And that's what we get to explore today. So we're going to have this very interesting conversation with the help of some experts from ReliaQuest and from Graphis who are here with us today to help us explore and get to know this threat landscape for phishing in all of its variants, all of the phishing and the smishing and the vishing, everything that you've got that you've heard about and maybe you already know and maybe you don't, but understanding a little bit more of how you can keep yourself, your teams, and your organization safe. This is going to be a fun conversation, maybe a little bit scary sometimes. I know when we talk about these attack vectors, but also then getting into those solutions and the ideas that you can protect, how you can protect yourself. So this is this is the good part, right? We get a little scared and then we find those solutions together. So let's dive into that together today. And I'm going to start by introducing myself again. My name is Jess Steinbuck. I'm a moderator here at Actual Tech Media and my fellow moderators, Keith Ward and Scott Becker, are here with us today on live live chat. But I do want to make sure before we get into it, we talk a little bit about prizes. So today on the EcoCast, you could win a $300 Amazon gift card. We're going to be giving those away every 30 minutes to lucky winners who are here live and present with us at the EcoCast. Now, as I mentioned a little bit earlier this morning, you can find the full terms and conditions linked for you in the handouts tab. So if you have any questions, feel free to go check that out. All right, well, with that last little bit there, I think it's about time that we kick things off. So I am going to bring out our wonderful keynote speaker. And to kick us off today, we have a familiar face on the EcoCast and one of my all-time favorite experts when we're talking about ransomware and threat actor discussions. That is, of course, Lindsay Kay, Vice President, Threat Intelligence at Human Security. Now, we asked Lindsay to come in and join us today because we wanted to start out by answering some of the more common questions that we hear from from all of you on these EcoCasts. So today is all about you, your concerns, what is on top of your mind. And that's what Lindsay's gonna help us explore. I do also have to put in a quick note here. Uh, oh, I see Patrick says, never forget the quishing. Yes, Patrick, we will talk about quishing, vishing, smishing, you, whatever you can come up with today. I wanna hear it. I wanna hear all your issues. Uh, all right, well, I do need to let you know that Lindsay and I are just having a little bit of a lag on our microphones. Uh, our connection seems to be a little slow. So. There uh, were some awkward delays when she and I were chatting this morning. And so I'm hoping that we've resolved it, but please bear with us if Lindsay and I have a, a little bit of a delay. We're gonna do our best to get through this conversation. We wanna make sure we get you some answers. Uh, so let's bring Lindsay on out here with us. Just one moment. All right, Lindsay, thank you so much for being back here with us on the EcoCast. It's so great to see you. Thank you for having me back. I'm excited to be here. <laughs> All right. Well, Lindsay, we have uh, collected some questions from the audience and we get a lot of questions about ransomware. We get a lot of questions about phishing. Uh, and this is something that I think the audience would really like to spend a little time digging into. So we've asked you to come on today and help us answer some of these questions that we've pulled uh, together over many webinars and megacasts and ecocasts. Uh, so are you ready to answer some of these burning questions from our audience? I am. All right, perfect. Okay, Lindsay, let's do this. So well, let's start with this one here. Since the burden of phishing can't just be on the user, how can an organization help its users co combat the threat of phishing? What do you got for us, Lindsay? Okay, so this is a super important distinction to consider since at this point, almost every user actually does know about phishing. 
that it's bad and that we need not to fall victim to it. And almost everyone has been exposed to phishing tests by the company they work for, but somehow phishing still succeeds anyway. So there's a couple other things that we should probably consider here. So companies definitely have an opportunity. So outside of sending those phishing test emails, we're offering kind of the typical security training on phishing to their employees. So organizations should really assume that phishing will likely happen. So it's important to have the controls in place to handle it. So this is stuff like anti-spam filters, multi-factor authentication, antivirus, and EDR. So focusing after the phishing attack does happen, now what do we start doing about it? So it's also important to ensure that users are updating their software. So especially their browsers and that the organization has a comprehensive program in place to make this happen in a way that's simple for users to do and really doesn't radically disrupt their workflow. So making it easy for your users to comply is super critical. So this ultimately helps ensure that users aren't the only line of defense in mitigating the effects of phishing. and really also allows the organization to have more opportunities to stop a possible attack. Well, Lindsay, that's, that's a really great insight. And, and I'm wondering, you know, we were talking about getting outside the usual ways of testing and training, um, but we also get a lot of questions about, so email-based phishing is, is the number one that, that everyone knows and is aware of, and that's kind of top of mind these days, but there are other phishing related threats, right? And, and so what other phishing style threats do you think the audience should be aware of and should have top of mind? Sure thing. So one example I wanna bring up is smishing which is phishing conducted via SMS. And it's certainly still something that's worth paying attention to because it remains in use by threat actors as a way to access organizations. So one example um, is that according to Mankin, a threat actor called UNC3944 and their financially motivated threat cluster, uh, actually regular, regularly used SMS phishing campaigns in order to obtain credentials that they would use to gain and escalate access to a victim organization. So after obtaining access via smishing, threat actors have also impersonated employees on calls to victim organization service desks um, because they want to obtain sort of MFA codes and or password resets. So to kind of further escalate their attack and kind of go about that. So ultimately, by obtaining these credentials via smishing, the threat actor was able to establish a foothold on the victim environment and continue on with their attack. So why is it that we care so much about smishing? So in general, users' mobile devices, such as personal cell phones, are largely outside the security perimeter of an organization um, and the things that they have full control over. Um, this makes the threat a lot harder to combat from a preventative perspective. So as a result, this likely underlines the importance of stopping not just the phishing itself, which an organization likely has limited visibility into all the entry vectors here, but stopping an attack as it gets further down the line using many of the tools I mentioned previously. So this is something that will likely become even more relevant as phishing of all kinds gets smarter with the use of AI tools and LLMs to generate the phishing contents based on what specific information can be easily gathered about a particular target. So this is something that our vendors will be speaking more about today. And it's a very relevant concern in understanding how it pertains to organizational security and what methods can be used to combat it is critical. I'm I'm so excited to dig into those a little bit more because you know we hear all the 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 smishing and the vishing and the and the quishing is that the QR code one like there's there's all these different ishings uh, and and just when you think you're getting a handle on one there's a new one and there's new evolutions and old ones so it's just ongoing uh, and and it is really important to kind of stay stay up to date uh, both as employees and as humans really uh, this is this really hits on all sides um, so. Lindsay, let's talk about that because there's so many different styles out there and uh, there's so many different ways that an attack can happen, that a phishing attack can happen. Uh, we get a lot of questions from the audience about what happens on the other side. So if that phishing attack is successful, uh, then what are the additional layers, whether people are thinking onions or jawbreakers or uh, hard candy with soft candy, whatever the metaphor is that they like, what are the layers of security uh, that organizations should be looking for and implementing to make sure that they're uh, um, protected all the way through beyond just that if that initial attack is able to, to get through? Awesome. Yeah. So I guess I've alluded to this a few times so far, but one thing I really want to emphasize here is that having a layered security approach is extremely relevant, not only to combating the threat of phishing attacks, but also an effective security approach in general. So it's something that you can kind of take away from this and use for a variety of your other security concerns as well. So kind of using the UNC 3944 attack that I referred to as an example, 
Um, there were several other opportunities to identify and thwart some of the malicious behavior post phishing. So after, for example, establishing a foothold, the a actor wanted to escalate privileges, uh, move laterally, and then perform internal reconnaissance. And what they did was they used a few well-known TTPs. So things like Mimi Cats, which we're all familiar with, um, dumping password vaults, using the information stealers like Medusa and other open source and publicly available tools. So these are things that we as organizations and security professionals are also familiar with. These aren't necessarily some sort of mystical zero day that we have never really heard about. So we do have some solutions in place that can help us with those. Um, so here is also where things like antivirus and EDR can be super helpful. So you can also implement rules for malicious behavior in a SIM if you have them. And keeping logs and alerting on suspicious behavior is another tactic that you can use. So using the UNC 3944 example, again, the actor exfiltrated data using benign tools. So our clone, Dropbox, um, and then eventually drop their ransomware. So they also used an open source tool um, called Microverse, which anybody can go look on the internet, uh, to look for Azure credentials and its secrets. So kind of bringing it into the club and a PowerShell script that allowed them to download a credential stealer that was staged on the victim's AWS bucket. So here, now you kind of look at some other uh, tools and utilities that we have at our disposal. So things like access logs, network logs, um, that could be used in order to identify these suspicious actions. So Active Directory enumeration uh, often remains super popular, especially in post-exploitation. Um, and in addition to logging, the use of things like ER and a SIM, uh, you can also look to implement something like an alert on the access of honey tokens. Um, but those are just kind of a couple of suggestions that I have. So um, in all, uh, a lot of our vendors today will talk about some other kind of tools and techniques, especially being phishing focused. Um, and it's worth kind of knowing that if and when phishing does succeed, um, especially a method that the organization doesn't have visibility into, like the smishing that I mentioned, um, there need to be subsequent security measures that will catch a suspicious and malicious behavior. So get excited for the vendors that we have here today and um, listen to what they say. Yes, I love that. Oh man, Lindsay, you have definitely set a great stage for us. We've covered, uh, you know, what organizations can do to help individuals because this is, you know, at its core, a, an individual and a human attack as well. Um, we, we've covered uh, what types of attacks that we can be looking for as individuals. Uh, and then we've talked about some of the layers that those organizations can put into place to, to help combat these threats. That is a great place to start. Uh, and, and I think hopefully we've answered some of those more common questions that we hear from all of you out there, uh, you know, on a regular basis. And now we get to dig in even further with some of our incredible expert speakers and vendors. So Lindsay, thank you again for coming here and helping us set the stage today. It's always such a pleasure to chat with you. Cool. Thank you so much for having me. All right, and now we have a question for all of you. What we are wondering is, uh, what is your time frame? Are you thinking short term? Are you thinking long term? Do you have an urgent need to solve some of these phishing related concerns or issues? Are you realizing that you, your team is a lot more exposed than maybe you wanted to believe or you hoped for? Um, and so maybe you need to make some, some urgent changes or is this a little bit longer term? You know, you're just keeping with the times. You're aware of the fact that the threats are changing and evolving. And so you wanna make sure you're changing and evolving and you're thinking a little bit more long term. There's no wrong answer and no judgment here. We're just trying to get an idea of where you are in the process right now. I'm going to leave that up for just another second and then we are going to move things along. This is also a good test run, guys, because as you know, I'm going to ask you throughout the day to click on these little polls and wish lists and, and uh, uh, what are shopping lists for, for resources. That's the other thing we're calling it. Uh, so keep this is your practice run. Make sure make sure that you're, you're, everything's working for you right now this morning. You've had your coffee. You're ready to click on the screen and, and get things rolling. All right, I hope you're ready. Are you with me? You ready? We're, we're good? Everyone's awake? Everyone's got their coffee? Excellent. Okay, we are going to jump into the good stuff now, my friends, and I am so excited to introduce you all to our very first expert presenter today on the EcoCast. And as you can see from your screen, we get to start out on a great note with the ReliaQuest crew. So up first, we will be chatting with Ja Marshall, Senior Technical Product Marketing Manager at ReliaQuest. Ja, thank you so much for being here with us today to kick off the EcoCast. Now, I know you have some awesome content lined up for today. Uh, we also wanted to make sure we save some time for questions at the end. So I am going to step back and hand things on over to you. Take it away, Ja. 
Thanks for the introduction, Jess. Um, hello, everyone. My name is John Marshall. I am a senior technical product marketing manager for ReliQuest. Um, I've actually been with the company for about six years now. Um, I started here as a cybersecurity analyst. Then I moved to do some threat hunting, uh, some threat detection before moving over to the, the product side of your organization. During that time, I've helped defend some of the toughest phishing attacks that our clients were facing and uncovered all types of uh, nasty ransomware um, and that were born from phishing attempts. But since then, ransomware has gotten even more sophisticated and more prevalent. In fact, ReliQuest threat research team recently published our Q3 cyber threat report on ransomware and data leak extortion. And we've uncovered some pretty interesting trends about the latest on ransomware that I actually would like to, to share with you. Um, so I want to spend some time sharing those trends and talking about the current uh, landscape of ransomware. And then I'll also share some numbers that show how phishing is still the primary vector for ransomware and then explain how the ReliQuest solution can help prevent these attacks through our various modules uh, listed here. So, but first, right, let's talk about what we saw in the third quarter of 2023, which was ransomware activity continuing to bombard many countries and industry sectors um, even after a record-breaking Q3. So ReliQuest observed numerous high-profile ransomware campaigns, um, large-scale extortion attempts using various techniques, um, and then also many new groups that quickly made their presence known. One ransomware group in particular that I want to bring to your attention um, is Rysedia. Uh, so you probably are familiar with this ransomware group that, you know, and you know that they typically attack the education sector. Um, in fact, since May of this year, 40% of all of their compromises were in the education sector. In Q3, though, we saw a shift to healthcare. So there were 17 hospitals, um, 166 clinics that were attacked by this group across the United States. Um, the tactics they use are pretty much the same, right? So RDP, uh, PS exec, PowerShell, et cetera. However, they use these tactics to steal sensitive data like social security numbers, um, you know, some patient files, et cetera. Um, and then they also auction that healthcare data out to, um, you know, individuals on the dark web. So looking at those, and then also another group that's pretty well known is, um, especially this year, is CLOP. So this group initiated a campaign against the Move IT or Move It uh file transfer software back in may of this year and it was it was pretty ugly so we saw this group naming clients of targeted organizations you know basically implying data had been stolen from multiple companies uh in the compromise they leaked ransomware or, or um, ransom uh, negotiations conversations that were had right they leaked information on the dark web they set up torrents which allowed for uh quicker downloads of the stolen data the goal of all this, of course, was just to get the organizations to pay the ransom. Um, however, from our research, it looks like the Move IT campaign has slowed down a bit um, and may be wrapping up by this group. They, they only named um, four companies in August, and then they named one in September, um, and then one in October. Um, I actually checked this morning and saw that there are a handful added to November already, so maybe they're picking back up, but, but things have definitely slowed down since July when it was at its peak. And then some other trends we found in Q3 was Lockpick being the, the most active ahead of Klopp. So even though Klopp is you know, still quickly rose to the top, um, Lockpick was definitely number one. And then Lost Trust, which is probably a rebrand of the Meta Encryptor, if you're, if you're familiar with that, um, that took eighth place in Q3 of, of this year. But what makes this kind of remarkable is that Lost Trust only created its data you know, leak site in, on September 26th just four days before the quarter ended. And in that short period of time, that group listed the names of more than 50 victims. So they were you know, putting their hat in the ring and making a, a big splash with that. And we also noticed that multiple companies on the Law, uh, Lost Trust site um, has also been listed on other uh, sites for other ransomware groups, um, which probably mean that either those companies may have been targeted twice or maybe Lost Trust affiliates uh, you know, have been attempted to re-extort them. Um, but overall, the activity throughout 2023 has become noticeably more prolific uh, than what we saw in the previous year. 
Um, in fact, here on the graph to the left shows the percentage of ransomware attacks that we've seen since September of last year to September of this year. And as you can clearly see, uh, the increase of tax um, this year, along with like the major spikes in Q2. And then on the right here, you can see the sectors that are targeted most by the ransomware groups. Um, although some sectors you know, are more prevalent than others, it's important to note that this is a wide range of industries. So no one is really safe from these ransomware attacks. And it's not to scare you, right? But it's just to show how important it is to understand these trends um, to know how to fortify your organizations against them. And then because um, I guess ransomware in itself, right? One fact about it that we all kind of know is that this is probably the way you can help to start. Phishing is still the number one way ransomware is still executed. So year over year, there's been surveys conducted like the one underneath the, the first bullet there that says organizations are basically still seeing a significant increase of email threats. Um, almost 90% of all of those organizations admitted to falling victim of a ransomware attack. If you look at the uh, at the recent ransomware reports that we've put out, right, you see that all the groups that we mentioned in there, most of them are using phishing as their primary method for delivering ransomware. Why? Because, you know, your end users are unsuspecting, right? And because there's so many different ways to fish. On the, on the right, I've listed, you know, the latest trends we've seen um, in attack methods for ransomware delivery through phishing. And really what you can see here, right? So we have vishing and smishing. There's, there's these uh, voice and text scams, which, you know, deals mostly with impersonating a user that gets into the information or maybe install their malware uh, or their ransomware. And then you have spear phishing and whaling, which is more successful than, than others on this list because the attackers craft a message that's personalized to the individual. And then this year, we, we've obviously seen a rise in uh, BEX, right? Business email compromise. This should be studied this year that um, these attacks, that a lot of the big big name uh, ransomware attacks came from uh, a BEC, right? So um, some of the other ones listed here around social media, QR code scams, which has been really, very popular um, in the last two quarters, um, mal malvertising, et cetera. They're vectors that we've seen a constant growth in, especially in Q2 and also um, you know, Q3. And then, you know, weaponizing documentation found on the dark web or other places that may have been leaked, right, uh, through foul, you know, rent, foul is ransomware. And also, we're also pretty big this year. What makes it tough is that the adoption of AI allows for things to be a lot easier. So although AI has been around for some time, with, you know, anyone having access to it these days, it can help assist with these attacks. So for instance, AI can, you know, have algorithms that will basically analyze vast amounts of personal and you know publicly available information to create highly personalized phishing emails or messages making it harder for the recipient to you know try to figure out if this is legit or or not so what this does is it increases the success rate of a spear phishing attack or a whaling attack but it decreases the level of uh, effort that an attacker has to do it right and then also with ai you can probably um, have a much larger scale of phishing campaigns, which makes it over, overall tough to stop. This is why, you know, we believe that a, a robust solution um, is required, right? It, it should have threat intelligence so you understand, you know, where you should be looking for, for the attacks, right? And help you become more proactive rather than uh, reactive. Um, and then that threat intel should also be incorporated into detections in that platform. And so the detection should be around phishing and ransomware, but couple that with the, with the intel you have to help uncover these sorts of threats that are happening in your environment. And then another key element here, right, to solving the problem is automating responses like, you know, block email sender, maybe isolate a host, delete a file or an email, so you can reduce the attacker's uh, dwell time within your environment. And then last but not least, right, you want to make sure that um, you have the ability to analyze these emails automatically, where if someone was to send an email over and it bypasses your secure email gateway or some sort of uh, protection mechanisms, because they do sometimes, right? Um, and those are the ones that typically land, ends up landing into a user's inbox and be the cause of an attack. You want to make sure you have the ability to analyze all of those emails pretty quickly um, and then respond back to that user as well. So. ReliQuest Gray Matter contains all of these things and more uh, to kind of help protect you against phishing attacks, um, phishing attempts, 
uh, ransomware attacks, so on and so forth. So what I'm going to do is kind of show you how we can do that. Um, and I'll start with uh, our gray matter Intel. So in this situation here, right, you really want to have something that you can help defend against the attackers, but you can't defend um, what you can't see, what you don't know is there. And that's why it's important to always have the most up-to-date intel on what the attackers are doing. So ReliQuest has a global team of experts, you know, uh, threat researchers who are dedicated to basically going out there, looking over the open, deep, and dark web and bringing in what they're seeing around new and emerging threats, right? So they also work alongside of, of various internal teams, like our threat hunting team, which will help them build their knowledge around what's happening from either our customer standpoint or what they're seeing when they do their threat hunts um, as well. And then there's also external uh, agencies that we, we, we speak with uh, around you know, whether it's government agencies like the FBI or, you know, so on and so forth, where we get information from them to push and publish that information all to 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 you. Right. So our website um, is a good place that has this published information. It contains some of the newer information, but they also produce uh, blogs. They produce webinars. They, they have um, great participation inside of our own podcast, which is what we call Shadow Talk. Um, but essentially what they talk about here and in, in all these different things is going to be really um, latest attack vectors, latest attack methods, any sort of recent discoveries that they're looking at, what sort of malware variants are out there, what sort of uh, tools that, you know, attackers are using for phishing and, and et cetera. Um, but this information also lives in gray matter um, as pictured here on the right, right? So, and it contains kind of everything you want to know about a malware variant or a threat actor or you know, maybe a campaign or an IOC and more. Um, I can actually just pull up Gray Matter right now and kind of show you exactly um, what you'll see if you was to pivot into Gray Matter and look at our, our Gray Matter Intel. So here's what you'll see um, when you pivot into Gray Matter Intel. I'm looking over here and I'm seeing, you know, our, our threat heat map, which kind of gives us what's more, more recent. I'm able to see the IP addresses or any sort of hashes. These are all the threats by type. Um, and then I see anything that the threat research team has put together for us to review, right? So we talked about lock, lock read earlier, we talked about CLOP, right? So if you look at this, this gives me any sort of information on this particular, you know, malware or threat uh, actor. I get a quick summary of what's happening, um, any sort of industries that are there targeted or known to target, right? Associated minor attacks um, that you'll see here. And then here are all the, the updates, right? So what you'll see here is, um, like I said before, they may have been adding different organizations to their, their, their site. I can come in here, look up CLOP and get to see um, what sort of updates they've been putting on their site. So I see a couple more uh, additions to their site for November, right? Um, and then I'm looking at this from a more targeted perspective where I can see where do they normally target this particular uh, ransomware group or malware typically targets these uh, areas, these locations, these industries, right? So being able to kind of come in here and look at that is kind of the first initial step. The second step really is not just having good uh, threat intel, but wanting to actually operationalize that threat intel and weaponize that threat intel by actually coming in here and putting that with your threat detection. So as you can see here from a ReliQuest standpoint, if I was this customer, I'm able to see that, hey, I have 277 different detections that are specific to CLOP deployed in my environment right now. Right. So I'm able to kind of come in here, look at those different detections that maybe I can see across either my minor attack framework or maybe across different risk scenarios that can relate to CLOP. Now, that's going to be the same for any sort of um, uh, malware actor, any sort of um, uh, malware itself, any sort of different sorts of um, threat intelligence. And the idea here is that you want to make sure you can put together something that is going to be able to detect based off of the new uh, and emerging threats that you have. So as we go back to uh, talking about Intel, right, the, the, the bottom line here, the bottom last uh, bullet point here is to have threat enabled detections, which is very important, right? So you want to have detections, but you also want to have threat enabled detections uh, to ensure that you're tracking the, the, the proper ransomware as well. So Gray matter in, in general, right, comes with a standard of thousands of detections, building blocks, and various sorts of reports. So we've built targeted detections to uncover the latest phishing attacks um, and also the latest ransomware. And so you can see here examples um, of our email threat detections on the right, 
uh, in that first column. Now, this isn't an a exhaustive list, but we look for um, various things based off different technologies. So you can see in the first column, there's you know maybe a phishing link was clicked or um, allowed malicious email. Maybe a phishing link was clicked followed by some sort of uh, successful MFA. Right? These are things that we can actually do based off the technologies you bring forth. So um, I listed a couple here on the right. So the far right column, you can see we have support for Abnormal, for Proofpoint, Microsoft, Google, et cetera. Um, but ultimately, our detection architects are going to work with you to recommend what detections are best based off of your current security posture, based off the technologies you have, and then also based off what they're getting from you know, the threat research team, the threat hunters, et cetera, to say, hey, these are the new and emerging threats. These are the things that we want to make sure we look out for. Um, and then they will continuously make recommendations um, to you based off of your environment as it changes. Hey, we just ripped out, you know, Microsoft and we put it in Google for this, right? Well, those are the things that we can actually do to say, hey, here are some additional detections you can do based off that change in your environment. Um, but once a detection, you know, triggers, uh, an investigation is confirmed, hey, this is a true positive, this is a, a, a phishing email that's malicious, going to be ransomware, right? What we can do, we give you the ability to respond from the same screen using those same technologies you see here to make sure that you have a unified workflow. And so that's with our, our respond capability. Right, so Gray Matter, what it does is it connects to your technologies, um, like your email security solutions. You know, think of your EDR or maybe your firewall via an API, and it just takes actions right from the Gray Matter screen to those technologies. So we have an entire library of pre-built respond actions um, that you can take using your existing stack. So this will help um, with containing uh, attacks, remediating attacks. Um, so take the example here on the screen. Let's say we had a, a phishing alert that triggers in your environment. So phishing link click, or maybe an allowed malicious email. Great matter what it does is it connects to your email security tool, and then it can block the sender or delete that email. Um, or maybe it can connect to your firewall or maybe your web proxy, your web gateway, and block that URL or that domain. It can also connect to your IAM solution to reset passwords, maybe terminate a, a session, right? So and if the investigation reveals more happened with that phishing email, that it wasn't just a phishing email that stopped, but maybe malware was downloaded through an attachment or they clicked the link and then something was downloaded and it's running all over, right? What, what we can do is we can connect to your EDR and then isolate that host, you know, quarantine that file, ban that hash to help prevent the spread of ransomware and stop that malicious email from, from getting any further. Um, so again, this helps kind of the phishing attack uh, reduce that time. And then let's just say, hey, something malicious slip past your email protection tools. What you want to do now is ensure you have the ability to automatically analyze that. And so what we've been able to do is create something that says if your users are reporting an email that says they believe it's uh, suspicious, you want to make sure you have something to analyze that automatically, deconstruct that email using AI to basically say this is good or bad and respond back to the user. And so that's something that we call the phishing analyzer. And we have the ability to provide that to any customer who is gonna to want to um, analyze those particular emails. So um, ultimately, right, the features of Gray Matter that I mentioned here, Intel, high fidelity detections, library of, of, of those respond actions, makes for a holistic approach to stopping ransomware born from phishing. Um, and then the last thing I'll say here is, uh, I've listed some material here if you wanna learn more. Um, the, the top one here actually goes to that threat report that I talked about earlier that is from our threat research team where they curated that. Um, it's a good read, has the latest info. And then the other links here are really just about gray matter, the phishing analyzers that I talked about, some of those respond actions. Um, and then the bottom one talks about our available our available uh, integrations that we have here. So feel free to reach out for more information um, or, use it, or using the uh, screen here for a demo. Um, we'll take you right there. But thanks again for, for listening. Uh, thank you so much, Joe, for that awesome presentation. Uh, it's such a great look at something that I think a lot of us hear about all the time, but it's obviously evolving constantly. And there is this tendency when something becomes ubiquitous to almost, you know, just sort of check it off in your mind, right? Yeah, I know about fishing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, to stop and kind of take that in-depth look every once in a while at how things are changing, have changed, uh, and make sure that you're up to date with that threat landscape. So I really appreciate you walking us through that. And we have a ton of great questions coming in already. So uh, let's try to sneak in a few of those before we have to wrap up here. Jai, you ready to dive in? Yeah, let's do it. Okay. Um, how does your phishing analyzer analyze your password protected attachments? How is that actually functioning? 
Yeah, so we use a process called um, email deconstruction, and basically there's a separate analyzer module per component of the email. Um, mm -hmm. And so what we do is we say, hey, if we're looking for an attachment, we have the ability to kind of unzip attachments, or we even have the ability to guess passwords using the context from the email that we've gotten, or maybe from historical uh, the data that it's received. Um, mm -hmm. In the event that we are unable to uh, run that file analyzer, we rely on the results of our other analyzer. So let's say like our sender analyzer, or maybe our header analyzer, uh, because it's unlikely that one portion of the email is malicious, but ultimately, right, that's kind of what we'd be able to do. We have the ability to, to uh, kind of input any sort of password in there automatically. Awesome. Okay. Um, we got a couple of questions here ja, about it, sort of wanting to take a more proactive approach. Um, and, and especially, you know, that is important. I think a lot of times when we're looking at ransomware is not just responding, but finding those, those kind of proactive detections. So, and, and practice and training and all the important things. Um, so question here, does ReliQuest conduct red team pen tests or, or are they doing anything else to help us stay ahead of ransomware threats? Yeah, so that's a good question. So ReliQuest, we used to offer red team services, but we were primarily going against the attackers. So it didn't make much sense for a client to, you know, say, hey, red team ourselves, right? Um, although we were fair and honest, they likely kind of read the report and say, hey, we, we, we want to look at this with one eye open. Sure. Um, what we offer instead is the ability to kind of run attack scenarios in your own environment and, and see if the detections and other security controls will, will catch it. So you can actually go into the environment and run ransomware scenarios um, and validate kind of uh, your controls, right? Um, and see kind of what's going on um, there as well. So I, actually I can probably, uh, if we have a, a, a little bit of time. Yeah, we got like two minutes. How that looks, right? So here's kind of different scenarios you can, you can kind of create. If you want it to, let's say, create a new scenario, um, you can just drag and drop from over here, right? You can say ransomware or whatever it is, run the scenario, um, and then that can pretty much help you with seeing what's going on in your own environment and ensuring that those detections, those different things, uh, controls are, are, are working. Hmm. Which, uh, yeah, of course. And that's that's exactly where you need it is in your own environment. So I love right. that. A little impromptu bonus demo there. Um, <laughs> okay, I'm going to keep sneaking in these questions. Uh, uh, let's see, for your automated response actions, is it always a human taking these actions? And how many are available to take? Yeah, so there's, there's hundreds of play actions that can be executed mm. since Gray Matter has over 80, I think it is now, integrations. And each integration has multiple uh, kind of actions and we, we're continuing to build more. Um, I actually linked the um, integrations um, kind of site on that PowerPoint for you to see. But in terms of who takes the actions, the play action can be taken by a human. So we call those human initiated. So the analyst who does the investigation um, can, if they notice something you know weird or if they, hey, this looks malicious, they can actually take the action. Um, but then there's also things that we consider to be platform initiated or platform driven where Gray Matter mm -hmm. can execute an action like blocking a URL or or reset a user's password based off of these high fidelity known bad detections, right? So if I have a phishing link click, we know it's a phishing URL, we know someone clicked it, that's the detection, we can have Gray Matter actually go ahead and block that URL, maybe reset that password. Um, that's obviously configurable based off of organization's uh, risk tolerance, but it's available for a lot, uh, our clients and a lot of them do take uh, full advantage of that. Well, ja, I have to tell you, I wish we could keep going with this because obviously there's there's lots more to dig into, and and I feel like this is such a a, a deep and constantly changing uh, discussion, which is why it's so exciting. So we'll have to keep having you come back. Um, but before we let you go today, if somebody out there is really excited, wants to jump in with ReliQuest, wants to get started, uh, you had that QR code for the demo. Is that kind of the first step that you would recommend? Yes, I would say the QR code for the demo. Um, then there's also the uh, contact information on the right side of that of that screen, right? Um, definitely reach out. That goes directly to our team. We can reach back out to you guys to kind of figure out exactly where you want to talk about. I know we kind of talk about a lot of different things, um, so we can make it specific uh, to you. But that's the best way to to get that first step going. That's so true. We cover, you know, a lot. And of course, everyone out there has some some things that are pretty, you know, common and then some things that are very unique to their organization, to their industry. So uh, reach out, you know, have that conversation with ReliQuest and, and find out exactly how that's going to fit in with you. Uh, and Ja, I want to thank you once again for being here with us. It has been so much fun chatting with you, as always. Glad to have you back on the Ecocast. I hope we get to chat again soon. Yeah, I'm glad. Hope to chat again soon as well.
All right, and now we have a little assignment for all of you out there. What John and I are wondering is what additional information you would like to get about the ReliaQuest solution. So think of this as your wish list, your shopping list. What resources would be helpful for you in following up on that conversation that we just had with John? And I have an extra little bonus uh, resource for you all right away, because if you are looking for a little bit more information, if you click on the handouts tab right now, click on that ReliaQuest link, and that slide that Ja just showed us right at the end there that had all the resources and the QR codes, we've actually loaded that into the platform for you because I know that went by pretty quick in the presentation. So we wanted to make sure that you had access to all of those resources. So Ja has collected some of the things that he thinks will be really helpful for you in following up on this conversation, learning a bit more, digging in a bit further. So click on that handout, grab that slide, make sure you've opened all those links. Think of this as, it's like a, a 10 bonus links for the price of one kind of deal. So make sure you've got that downloaded, make sure you've got that set aside, make sure you've got those access to those links to that QR code because all of that is going to be really helpful when we follow up. So keep clicking on the poll, head over to the handouts tab. And while you're doing all of that, I am going to give away a $300 Amazon gift card. Now a reminder that you do need to be here live and present at the EcoCast in order to win. And our very first winner here with us today is Noah Leroy of Michigan. Noah Leroy of Michigan. Congratulations to you, Noah. We will follow up with you after we wrap. Now there are still more chances to win that Amazon gift card today. Plus I'll remind you all that we do have that best question gift card coming at you from each one of our sections. So that means that if you ask a question, even if we don't get to it in one of our Q&A sessions with our speakers here today, you are still entered to win. So keep those questions coming in. And I'm looking at them now. I see some great questions. Bonnie, I see you. I love that. Great presentation, says Bonnie. And a big thank you to Ja. I agree. That was an awesome way to kick off the day. And the fun is just going to keep on rolling here today, folks, because we are going to move into our very next presentation. And this is, as you can see from your screen here, another absolute rock star and also another familiar face here on the EcoCast. And that is, of course, Miles Walker, Channel Development Manager at Graphis. Miles, thank you so much for being back here with us again today on the EcoCast. Now, I know you have a lot of information to cover. We also want to leave some time for questions and the audience is alive, awake, alert and enthusiastic today. So the questions are coming in hot. So, Miles, I'm going to hand things on over to you and I'll chat with you in just a moment here. Take it away. All right. Thank you so much for that introduction, Actual Tech. Super excited to be here. Uh, today we're talking about Graphis and specifically ransomware and preventing phishing and spear phishing attacks. I've got a lot to cover, so let's dive right in. But before I do that, um, often people say, Miles, what actually is Graphis? And this is a little bit about who we are. So we were founded in the U.S. in 2015. And kind of our mission or our mission statement or our goal is to simplify and automate phishing defense. Uh, we integrate with Microsoft 365 and Google Workspace. And I uh, definitely need to show you that we have won some big awards that we're super proud of over the past couple of years, whether it's our Cybersecurity Excellence Award, our SMB Tech Fest Award, our Get App ca uh, Category Leaders for 2022 and 2023. Um, and we were rated the Category Leader in Email Security as well, which we're super proud of. Um, some key words about our company. We're simple, we're powerful, we're automated. I'm going to dive into that in a little bit, but setup for our um, solution is really quick. You know, we can get up and running usually within about five to 15 minutes. We're powerful and that's using our self-learning AI. I'm going to be diving into that in a lot of detail later on. And of course, we're automated. So no manual rules needed. Our threat analysis wizard automatically re removes reported emails. And once again, I'm going to be diving into that in a little bit. So let's dive right in. So I'm talking about ransomware and often I get asked, Miles, you know, you talk all over the world, whether it's in you know Canada, the US, Australia, the UK, and what is the relationship between ransomware and phishing? And like a relationship in the real world, it's a little complicated, but when we actually dive into ransomware and phishing, it's not actually that complicated when we look at it. And what that relationship looks like, 80% of all ransomware attacks involve a phishing email. So if that shouldn't give you pause, if that shouldn't give you a reason to grab that camera, take a photo, this is something you probably want to share with your IT and tech team. Um, this is pretty scary that when we're talking about ransomware attacks, phishing is still the major gateway 
where all these attacks are happening. Um, phishing is uh, the number one vector for the fourth straight year used by cyber criminals. So this is something that everyone's talking about. It's phishing, phishing, phishing. And if you don't have a phishing solution in place right now, you're most likely going to have one in the next 12 to 18 months. So start doing your research. I'm not saying Gravis has to be the solution for you, but it's a great, robust solution. And you have to at least get out there, see a demo, see how powerful it is, and see you know how it competes against the other phishing solutions that are on the market. Um, when we're talking about companies worldwide, I'll hit you with another scary number. Once again, you might want to take a photo of this with your camera. 71% of companies worldwide were affected by ransomware in 2022. That doesn't mean they were hit by a huge ransomware attack, but that means that somehow it affected their business. And this is pretty scary to think that this number was probably hovering around the 40% mark before COVID, and now we're seeing 71%. Um, you know, trending for 2023, this number is only rising. So this is something that's here and it's here to stay. And when we talk about ransomware, we talk about phishing, we have to throw in a little bit about AI because, um, you know, artificial intelligence or machine learning is something that everybody's dealing with in their day to day life. And AI is helping hackers make better phishing emails. This is super scary because, you know, probably two years ago, we saw a lot of phishing attacks. Like I mentioned earlier, it's the number one threat vector used by cyber criminals. And this year, you know, with ChatGPT, uh, you know, jumping into the fray. AI is really helping these um, hackers make those phishing emails more real and, um, you know, taking away those spelling errors and making those emails harder to spot by the naked eye. Um, when we want to dive into some numbers here, I always like to look at what's going on in the cybersecurity world. And this one's pretty scary. This was um, a recent study with over 650 security professionals all across the globe. And what they found was that 75% of security professionals witnessed an increase in attacks over the past 12 months. So three out of four said attacks are going up and 85% attributed the rise in these bad actors using generative AI. And people often say, Miles, what's the difference between generative AI and, you know, machine learning or regular or uh, traditional AI? And generative AI is pretty scary because we're seeing things like deep fakes. Um, you know, they're cloning people's voices these days. And they're, they're basically pivoting around what they did in the past. And they're using the technology we use today against us. And cyber criminals... And, you know, the general public are using chat G, uh, GPT, but a lot of people are using it for all the wrong reasons. And that's where, uh, you know, we come into play. Um, and what I want to get at is I like to say the genie is out of the bottle, so to speak. And when I say the genie is out of the bottle, um, what I'm talking about is AI is here. It's not going away. Uh, chat GPT was the fastest growing app in the history of the world this past year when it launched. Um, they had more than a million people signed up to the app quicker than anybody. They had, um, you know, a hundred million people signed up quicker than anybody. And this is something that we need to embrace because it's not going to be gone anytime soon. Um, you know, we're not going to wake up in, you know, 2024 in March and AI has completely gone away. It's involved in our lives in every aspect from, you know, uh, using Netflix to Apple Music to Spotify to how we bank to how we actually operate our businesses. So um, if your business is not using AI, there's probably some tools you can use to automate some of those, um, you know, menial tasks you're probably doing right now. Um, and when we're talking about AI, this is the threat vector. Like I said, uh, phishing emails are the threat vector that cyber criminals are using. And how are they using it? Well, here's four simple ways they're currently using AI. So AI makes things uh, easier than for anyone, or AI makes it easier than uh, ever for anyone to generate content. So they can actually produce an email, a phishing email, a phishing attack uh, using AI, whether that's ChatGPT or one of the other chatbots out there. Um, natural language processing or NLP, this is something that's relatively new uh, to the um, cybersecurity world over the last year, but it allows to, uh, to have AI comprehend and recreate realistic written content. Um, when we're talking about that, um, you know, AI could read all of Shakespeare's works over his years writing and, you know, write a new play using his workflow. And that's what ChatGPT uh, ChatGPT can do. And, you know, natural language processing is kind of the next step in that formation. AI chatbots can correct errors like poor grammar or misspellings. You know, 
you used to be able to see those phishing emails and go, this is this is junk. This is garbage. I can tell. So many spelling errors. Or, you know, you'd have a West African prince, you know, reach out to you wanting wanting money. And those days are long gone. People have seen them. And what we've learned with these cyber criminals, they, they do something once. If it works, they'll do something twice if it works. When it stops working, they pivot and they do something different. So, you know, whether that's attacks through Instagram or Twitter or quishing attacks, which are QR code phishing. There's so many different ways that these cyber criminals are looking uh, to damage people individually and businesses these days, and they're using these chatbots to help. And lastly, um, AI can translate content into different languages. That's what's scary. So it doesn't have to be a native English speaker who is sending out these emails. They're often from you know, the likes of Turkey, Eastern Europe, Russia, China, uh, or North Korea. And they can take what they want to write and using these chatbots, they can obviously put it in and it can be translated and actually sound like it's a real email from a speaker who speaks English. All right, when we're talking about um, phishing, I always have to bring up the difference between phishing and spear phishing. So combining spear phishing with AI technology delivers shockingly successful results for bad actors. And when I'm talking about spear phishing, people say, well, Miles, what's the difference between phishing and spear phishing? So phishing is when you cast a web, you see what you get back. Uh, spear phishing is a much more targeted approach. So, for example, um, they might know that you're part of the alumni at your, you know, your university or college you went to, and they're using that in a phishing email to say, "Hey, we're part of the alumni association." For example, at Rutgers University, and you know, we've been hit with some cyber attacks this past year, so we need to change the way you support you know, being part of our alumni association. So we just wanted to let you know that, you know, because cyber attacks are on the rise, we've decided to go with a new bank account. That's an example of a spear phishing attack because they got a little piece of information. And what they're using that for is a more targeted approach. And using AI um, and automation, a lot of these cyber criminals can send out more sophisticated spear phishing attacks that even just two or three years ago weren't possible because, you know, they didn't have these solutions uh, in place. Rather than a single cyber criminal tricking another individual into handing over sensitive data or details with a targeted attack, a scammer can now train AI to do it for them on a mass scale. So we've only just seen the tip of the iceberg when it comes to spear phishing attacks. Um, another term that often gets used is called whaling. And whaling is when you go after, you know, the big fish, so to speak, pardon the pun. And, uh, you know, um, often people call this executive spoofing, or that's kind of down a different lane. But we're going to start to see spear phishing attacks where these cyber criminals have a little bit of information, and it's going to be much more targeted than it was in the past, which is pretty scary because of AI. So how do you combat these threats? Let's bring this all back full circle to graph us here. So AI is being used more and more to increase the productivity of bad actors, making it harder for humans to decipher what is real or fake. This is something I've seen, you know, um, at the forefront of cyber criminals work over the past year. I'm seeing emails that are way better crafted, less spelling errors, and way more targeted. And we're seeing this more and more. AI is the only way to keep up with the escalation and sophistication of these attacks. So whatever solution you're using, it has to have AI built in because you have to know that that machine learning is front and, uh, you know, you know, foremost, um, you know, in the minds of the cyber criminals. And that's how you're going to go and, uh, you know, try to try to, you know, look out and make sure that the attack doesn't hit you close to home. The core strength of AI is impersonation. All right. Um, and what Graphis is, it's a tool that can provide an x-ray view and it is required to determine if an email is real or fake. At the end of the day, um, we want to give your team a fighting chance against these cyber criminals. And I always say, you're not going to get bigger muscles if you don't work out. You're not going to become a better basketball player if you don't shoot a lot of shots, unless you're Shaquille O'Neal. Um, and you're not going to be better at cybersecurity and you won't improve your team cyber hygiene if you don't get to see these emails and actually get to use them. So the core strength of Graphis is machine learning and we have a big AI base. Um, and we come back to the first level. So that's the trust graph. That's the core of our protection. So we use our patented AI technology and we analyze historical and real-time communication between people, devices, and networks. So that's the deep learning. So we look at everything on an email from the country it's coming from, the sender, what the domain is, you know, the attachments, what kind of device, the IP address. And we create a, a trust score 
um, much like a credit score where we say, yes, this is safe or no, it is not safe. And that's where a trust graph, you know, really shines. Um, and it rates the trustworthiness of that email. And it is the core for identifying and blocking social engineering attacks and, of course, protecting you from zero-day attacks. So that's the AI or the special sauce, as we say. So the three layers of protection, we got automatic quarantine, which looks after um, you know those malicious emails coming through. Employee shield, that's our most visual layer of defense. So that layer you're going to be working with on a daily or maybe a weekly basis. I don't get, you know employee shield banners on my emails every day, but definitely one a week for sure. That looks at suspicious emails. So it's hit a bunch of these targets. It probably doesn't have anything malicious, like a malicious payload, but it's definitely suspicious. And that employee shield banner will actually detail what type of potential phishing attack the email might contain. And lastly, report phishing. So that's um, Fish 911, where suspicious or unwanted. So we can just forward that to an inbox. And the nice thing is, is later on, if you turned out that that was actually a legit email, you can go back and uh, have it reinstated. So employee warning banners, um, if you're getting a anti-phishing solution that you're going to be bringing into your stack, make sure it has some type of warning banner so that your team can actually learn how these emails work. You can see on the right-hand side, you can report phishing or report a false positive. So often the emails come through, they're clearly phishing. You report that phishing button. Then all the other emails like that that have been sent to your organization will pull that email. It's a super powerful thing that is very unique to us. And you can alert your user, empower your user, and analyze that threat. You can see the Employee Shield banner right there. Um, the Employee Shield banner is fully customizable, you know, different message, different color, depending on the organization. And it actually tells you what type of potential phishing attack you're going to see. So here's an example. The sender, Steve Rogers at Gmail, sending from an email domain is not yet trusted. So it might just be the fact that you haven't actually communicated with this person, Steve, for example. And that's why they're putting up this banner. So the email has probably hit all the targets, you know, through our, you know, uh, trust graph. Um, and we realize, okay, this is someone new to your organization. Maybe it's something like the below. The display name of this email closely resembles an executive's name. So maybe that's something like domain spoofing um, or executive spoofing. So, you know, that is something to warn the team about that, you know what, this is something that, you know, you might want to dive into or you might want to talk to your IT team or your other tech professionals to make sure, um, you know, it's a safe email. When we're talking about Fish 911, that's our last level of defense, so reporting suspicious emails. And Fish 911 transform your users into active shield of defense. Often people say that, you know, the end user or the the worker, the um, the team is the, you know, the, the closest you can get to having an attack or the weakest link, might, some people would say. We like to turn that weakest link into the biggest asset where we empower each user to be part of their cyber hygiene. So you can report suspicious phishing emails, um, automatically quarantine, and you can analyze that threat. So the IT team can dive in and go, hey, you know what? This is a legit email. Or maybe it's not, and that's why um, it's a great thing that we have Fish 911 to report those suspicious emails. Um, and I mentioned earlier, we can get up and running quickly. So Graphis works via API. Um, as a Microsoft 365 or Google Workspace app and is very simple to set up. So five to 15 minutes is a typical amount of time, um, definitely under an hour, that's for sure. And no changing of MX records, installing agents or devices or configuring email filtering rules and policies. That's a big one. If you bring on a solution, you want to make sure that you can get up and running quickly and you don't want to spend a lot of hours on that. That's a big thing for us. You know, the trust graph starts working, you know, right away. It's an automated initial, initial, initialization that's hard to say. Um, and the self-learning algorithm begins an, analyzing historical uh, interactions right away. Um, so that's something. So it'll look at each individual inbox and go, yeah, this is someone who is a trusted person to talk to. This person, well, you know what? We've never talked to them before. And they can look back at historical data and figure that out quite quickly. And then the self-learning algorithm is constantly analyzing new interactions and evaluating the trust rating to keep you protected. So that's how you get up and running quite quickly. Um, I always got to bring in NIST because NIST kind of is the framework, definitely the most popular framework used in the US uh, and Europe, uh, as well as Canada. Um, I can go with North America, of course. So NIST Cybersecurity Framework, um, this is a non-for-profit. It's a National Institute of Standards and Technology, and they're trying to help people against getting hit by cyber attacks. So, you know, they give you a kind of a playbook 
with the identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover model. And this is how our other solutions um, fall into the NIST cybersecurity framework there. So Graphis fall, obviously falls under protect. You know, maybe you use another one of our solutions like dark web ID, which is our dark web monitoring that falls uh, under identify. Or maybe you use another product like Volscan, which also falls under protect. So, um, you know, that's a great slide to take a photo of because if you don't know much about the NIST cybersecurity framework, you've got to do your research because this is something so important. And being, you know, a non for profit, they give you, you know, the the tools, um, you know, to make your place your your place of work more um, more robust and have a better cyber hygiene. All right, I want to. I've got two more slides, but of course, we need to give you an offer because it is um, you know, November here and Christmas is just around the corner. So we're doing 20% off and one month free if you sign up with Graphis. Um, Graphis is an AI powered email security solution. Um, one of the most awarded solutions that you will find. Um, and we're super proud of the work that Graphis has done. Um, we use it every day and we love the, you know, the power and what um, you know, Graphis can do to you know, keep your house and keep your home and keep your business safe. Um, lastly, um, if you have enjoyed today, I do post a lot of content that you can repurpose. And when I say you can repurpose, I put videos out that is often for the IT world to look at and reshare. And that is just to, you know, show what's going on in the cybersecurity world. I posted a video just this past week about how, um, there's a $3.5 trillion attack that appears um, possibly eminent on our horizon to do with financials. You know, Save the Children was recently hacked. I did a video about that a week or two ago. So feel free to add me up. I would love to connect with you. I don't use LinkedIn as a selling tool. I use it as an informative, um, you know, information tool. That's it for me. <laughs> well, Miles, I can definitely vouch for that. You are a go-to for me when I need to dig in and, and explore a topic a little bit uh, in greater detail because you always have some great analogies. You're <laughs> such a storyteller with this information, uh, which makes it really easy to understand. Uh, and so I want to thank you once again for an awesome presentation. And I know the audience got a ton out of it. I can tell because we already have a lot of questions coming in. Miles, are you ready for some more storytelling? Are you ready for some questions? I am. I don't know. Have I gone off camera there? I'm not sure. Yeah, I lost your camera. I was hoping maybe it was a... Let me just, uh, let me just do a, a, an on and off again. Uh, Let's try I don't on know and off again. I don't know if you know the TV show, The IT Crowd, which is- I uh, love that, that show. My favorite shows. And you know, being born in England myself, I love uh, right. every answer is turn it on, turn it off again. Have you tried um, I like the, the one when he says, I'm sorry, do go. you know what a button is? Are you from the past? <laughs> <laughs> so you've seen, that, you've seen both seasons then? Yes, yes. Well, we, should put a, we should put a plug in. If you've not seen The IT Crowd, I know it was on Netflix for a while, Google the IT crowd. I know you can watch a lot of them on YouTube as well. I think they're all on Netflix. Go watch it right now. It's hilarious if you work in IT. It's it's important yeah. in cultural research and development. Uh, all right. Well, now that we've got Miles back, uh, thank you for catching that. Uh, the good old off and on again. All right, let's start with this question here. Miles, sure. we have a secure email gateway. Is this going to replace it? Okay. So, um, a secure email gateway, or the cool term is SEG, of course. Um, so you have an SEG. Um, so a little bit about secure email gateways. They're great. They're great protection tools. Uh, they've been around since the early 2000s. You know what haven't been around since the early 2000s? Um, you know, AI-based anti-phishing solutions like ours, like the others that are out in the marketplace. So mm -hmm. secure email gateways are great. Um, you could either use it as, you know, um, a tool that you can run, you know, side by side with us. Or you could use ours, um, you know, just on its own. It could be a standalone. Um, you know, people using more than one tool is always great. I'm never going to say, you know, give up some of your solutions. But if money is a thing, um, which it often is, um, you know, our our tool could definitely replace a secure email gateway. The numbers we're finding are between 40 to 60 percent stronger than um, secure email gateways out there. And why? They just haven't um, evolved like some of the uh, AI-based solutions that are in the marketplace today. 
Well, I think that's a great feed into another question that we got because I, I'm, I'm guessing that a lot of folks in the audience are, you know, in this phase of evaluating whether they are, are adding new solutions onto existing legacy systems or whether it's time to replace entirely. Um, so we got another question that I think feeds into what you were just sure. talking about. Does Graphis layer on top of Microsoft Defender or is the idea to be a replacement for Microsoft Defender for organizations that are already using that? What do you think? Uh, you know what? Funnily enough, it's pretty much the same answer as the first one. They can work side by side. Lots of people, though, are using Graphis to replace Microsoft Defender. Um, mm -hmm. Microsoft Defender is a great solution, and it's just like a secure email gateway in the sense of you can keep it, and you can add ours, or you could replace it with ours. Oh, nice and easy. Okay. Uh, I'm going to keep going here. Oh, this is a good one because privacy comes up a lot. Is Graphis going to analyze our internal emails? Um, when, when we say analyze, no, it's not going to be going through every, it's not going to know Jess, you know, who you, who you've talked to and you know, what, what, where you're going for coffee. Um, but it will know who you communicated with. So Jess, say you communicated with your cousin, it will mm -hmm. know that's a trusted relationship because maybe you texted your, or emailed your cousin four times in the past year. But if suddenly you start getting an email from someone that is not your cousin and it is an unknown user, um, you know, it will flag that as, you know, suspicious because you haven't had any communication. So it's really protecting, you know, the end user from talking to people that might not be people you want to talk to. You know, suspicious cousins. I get it. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, let's sneak in one last question here because I think this is kind of a fun one, Miles. Uh, right. You know, customization comes up a lot. How do we make this fit, you know, us and, and our team and what's going to work for us? And user experience, as we know, is very important. So sometimes these colors and, and sort of stylistic choices really make a difference. So can I change the colors of the warning battles or banners, excuse me? <laughs> Sure. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I mentioned that earlier. It's fully customizable. So good question. Mm -hmm. I love to follow up on that because that really does hit home with a lot of people. A lot of the solutions mm -hmm. out there have some type of warning banner. You can't change it. It's one stock color. I mean, we like to say keep it kind of, you know, our graph is pinky purple or a red so that people will see it. So it's vibrant. Um, but you can totally change it. You can change the messaging. You can change everything. We think you should probably keep the type of phishing attack it is because that will help your employees grow and learn. Um, but if you wanted to, you could actually even change that. Um, once again, we don't recommend it always because we think, you know, we're going to be giving good information, but it's fully customizable. You can put, you know, a logo, you can put whatever color you like, but we always say keep that color, hopefully pinky, purpley red. So it's a little bit scary definitely don't make the warning banner green because that would maybe go, oh, people think that's fine. <laughs> that's such a great point. Yes, avoid calming and relaxing colors when alerting. Exactly, that. yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, Miles, as always, I wish we could keep going because there's lots more to dig into here. We are going to switch these over to live chat. We'll make sure that your team gets any questions uh, over email as well so we can get some answers back to everyone out there. Um, before you leave us, though, if somebody in the audience is really looking to get started, wants to jump in with Graphis right away, what would you recommend as that very first step to learning more or, or getting rolling? Yeah, well, you know, get on get on with one of our specialists and see a demo. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I kind of mentioned earlier that if you don't have a phishing solution in place right now, you're going to have one in the next 12 to 18 months. You know, when I right. started, there was just a handful. Now they're popping up all over. And, you know, these solutions are not going away. Like we're in a pretty exciting time in the, in the phishing world for, for vendors because, you know, everybody needs to have help. You know, we can't thwart these cyber criminals by just, you know, suddenly becoming smarter. We need AI tools to combat the AI that these cyber criminals are using. So best bet, see a demo, see what the solution's like, ask a lot of questions. And you know what? Hopefully we'll uh, see you in the Graphis family at some time. I love that. Well, thank you so much, Miles. And I really appreciate you being here to give us so much uh, wonderful information, answering some questions. We've got some great resources and takeaways. So a lot of cool stuff going on. Uh, and it's a lot of fun to chat with you as always. Thanks so much. Well, hi team. I was talking to all of you and I had muted my microphone. So you were all sitting there in silence while I was saying awesome and wonderful things to all of you. Well, welcome back. <laughs>
<laughs> it's not it's not a live show without somebody coming in muted, right? Uh, well, and as they say in IT crowd, have you tried turning it off and on again? That's the theme of our day today. Anyways, folks, uh, just a big, a big thank you to Miles for that awesome presentation. And also a reminder to click on this wish list that you see up on the screen here. What we want to know is what is the additional information you would like to get about the Graphis solution? So. Are you looking for those data sheets, uh, case studies, pricing details? What are you looking for? Oh, Mark says, it's okay, Jess, it's home day. He says, you have to say it in a camel voice. That was my best camel voice, Mark. You got it, how'd I do? You, you let me know, thumbs up, thumbs down. Uh <laughs> I'll work on the camel voice. All right, so you guys are gonna click on that poll there and let us know what additional information you want about Graphis. So many great ways to follow up. As much as we wanna believe we're gonna remember everything from these sessions, we just won't. There's too much information. It comes at you so fast and there's so much to remember here. So these uh, follow-ups, these wish lists, these shopping lists, these are great ways to make sure that you get the resources that are helpful for you from these teams so that you don't have to go digging for them after. This is the easy button. So click, click on the poll there, click on that wish list and make sure you get the info that you are looking for. I'll also remind you to head over to the handouts tab. Make sure you've got the Graphis handout all about phishing defense for Microsoft 365 and Google Workspace. I saw a bunch of questions coming in about that exact thing, Microsoft 365 and Google Workspace. These are obviously important environments, so please do check out that handout. Make sure you've got that saved. Hold on to that for later uh, and, and take a look. Um, but for now, we do have some more excitement in the Ecocast today, and then I will let you on, get on about your days. We are going to do another prize giveaway. This is our last prize giveaway, so I will read out the winners and then I will read out the whole winners list. I do want to remind you all that you do need to be here live and present at the Ecocast in order to win. And uh, if you have any questions about the full T's and C's, they are in the handouts tab for you. All right, our next two winners of a $300 Amazon gift card today is Dan Soares of West Virginia. Dan, I got to tell you, the, the human on our team who hands me all the prizes and sends them to me has written in the margins here uh, next to West Virginia, take me home. <laughs> So that's now stuck in my head for the rest of the day. Thank you for that. Dan Soares of West Virginia uh, with a solid Take Me Home Country Roads theme song. Uh, and then Sean Goner of Washington. You have won $300 Amazon gift card. Sean, I don't have a theme song for you, but we'll work on it. Uh, Sean Goner of Washington, you have won a $300 Amazon gift card. I'll read that full winners list. We've got Noah Leroy of Michigan, Dan Soares of West Virginia, and Sean Goner of Washington. All right. Well, not only do some of you have awesome theme songs, you all have $300 Amazon gift cards. We will be following up with you. And we do have that $50 best question gift card coming at you. So we'll be looking through all the questions that were asked today, and we will make sure to send you uh, your gift card if you have won that. Uh, well, my friends, that is bringing us to the end of our day today. It was short, it was sweet, but man, did we learn a lot. I am so glad that we got to have these conversations. And as always, I do want to remind you that if you're sitting here on the Ecocast today and thinking that you have a solution that you would like to present to this community, we would love to make that happen. So send us a message if you are interested in presenting at a future summit, an Ecocast, a Megacast, whatever you have in mind, you can reach us at connect at actualtechmedia.com. All right. Well, with that, on behalf of the Actual Tech Media team, I want to thank our wonderful speakers here with us today from ReliaQuest and from Graphis for making this Ecocast possible. A big thank you to the IT crowd for sponsoring our fun, to, uh, to all of you who contributed ishing uh, <laughs> suggestions. Uh, hopefully you can all come up with a few more uh, ishings in, in mind. And, uh, and really thank you to all of you for attending, for participating, for asking some great questions and just being a lot of fun to hang out with. You know, the, the world of fishing is one of those. And as we talked about a lot today, it's been around for a long time. It is changing rapidly. And I think in some ways, because we're so familiar with the idea of fishing, uh, some people have started to sort of let it dull a little bit in our minds. It's not quite, doesn't have quite the sharp a trigger response that it used to have uh, in terms of concerns, but it is a huge concern and it is evolving. So even if you think you understand how phishing is kind of working, you know, you're looking for those spelling errors and emails, things are changing quickly enough that it is important to stay on top of. So conversations like this 
are a great way to make sure that we are matching that evolution pace, right? That we're keeping up with the pace of those threat actors. And that is so important. And today we really got to dig into, you know, I talked about that at the start, that Venn diagram of tech, of, of human, of psychology, of strategies, of hard tactics, the whole kit and caboodle is all part of this conversation today. And I hope that really you have enjoyed this as much as I have and gotten as much out of it uh, as I have as well today. Uh, and I really hope that we will see you again soon. We have a big virtual summit that we'd love for you guys to come and join us on. That's tomorrow. This has been a jam-packed week. There's been a lot. And for those of you that I see in, in repeat and repeat and repeat EcoCast and Megacast, man, you guys are really getting a lot of great info out of the week to <laughs> this one. And the, tomorrow's is going to be no exception. We're going to talk about exploring innovation in IT. How cool is that? And the, the goal of that, of course, up-leveling business outcomes. So lots of great things coming your way. That's Thursday. November 9th, 11 a.m. Eastern. Remember, we kick the summits off a little bit early. So if you're used to that noon Eastern start, we are starting at 11 a.m. Eastern tomorrow, 8 a.m. Pacific. So nice and early for you California folks. Get that coffee and come join us for a morning of information and good times. We will be talking about exploring innovation, in IT, up-leveling business outcomes. Michael, I see already saying, looking forward to tomorrow's event. So excited to see you there, Michael. I will be here with you. Uh, and we're gonna have a, a guest moderator visiting with us as well. So those of you who know Melissa Palmer, she'll be sticking her head in to hang out with us. And, uh, and I know that will be a lot of fun. So please come back and join us tomorrow. And until then, I hope you all have an absolutely beautiful end to your day.